Extreme weather, record-breaking temperatures, and ever more devastating hurricanes will require us to demand more of the state. And it's about time, says Christian Parenti. Parenti is Associate Professor of Economics at John Jay College. His books include Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change, and the New Geography of Violence. I sat down with him this fall in his neighborhood in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, to talk about the risks and opportunities inherent in this moment. Take a look. We're in uh, Monsignor McGoldrick Park in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. We're not far from the site where oil refining began in America. We're at the edge of one of the largest oil spills in American history, which is an underground oil spill. It's traditionally, traditionally a working class Polish neighborhood that is slowly but surely gentrifying as much of New York gentrifies. Probably one of the early manifestations of climate crisis will be a new urban crisis in which Due to rising sea levels and intensified storms, there will be more inundations of urban infrastructure and with those inundations are rotting out of that infrastructure and capital and population will start leaving the coastal cities. And when that happens, the value of these properties declines, the tax base declines, it will make it that much harder for municipal governments to defend cities with seawalls or by retreating from certain coastal areas to, to build bio shields. You know, there was a very serious urban crisis in New York City in the 1970s, which was population decline, uh, abandonment of buildings, disinvestment. We could easily see that pattern return to a place like Greenpoint, Brooklyn, if there aren't proper adaptive measures taken by the government. But we could also see this city as a model of, of appropriate design. And right now we're in a moment of sort of maybe peak denial where everyone is hostage to these property values and even mayors who might want to plan for these sorts of events realize that they can't articulate too explicitly or aggressively the fact that the cities are, are threatened by sea level rises without possibly triggering uh, a lack of confidence or a collapse of confidence in property values and they need those property values to be high to have the taxes to build sea walls to retreat from the sea etc cetera, etc cetera. with climate change the state is coming back and the question is only what form of state will that be is it going to be a repressive racist police state that tries to keep a lid on the the new sacrifice zones of the molding once inundated cities or is it going to be a more progressive version of the state we could hopefully with enough pressure with the appropriate kinds of political movements we could use these crises to really kind of reclaim the state and turn it into a more progressive force in society by helping to decommodify housing, decommodify health care, decommodify education, all in the name of protecting society and protecting the most vulnerable and operating collectively. And that's going to have to require that sort of uh, you know, socialization of the costs of reproduction is going to require redistribution. The elites are going to have to pay more than they currently do. And in many ways, that would be a good thing for the economy at large, because part of the problem we have in capitalism right now is the problem of over accumulation. There's simply too much money and not enough profitable outlets for it to be invested in. Thus you get one financial bubble after another. Capitalism is continually dependent on subsidies and guidance from the state. And what we need to do is become aware of this and then move it in the right direction. And what really needs to be done is for the state to take much of this liquidity that's sloshing around the international financial system, take it through taxes and invest it in uh, public infrastructure, in adapting to climate change at the, the scale of cities on, on coastlines, and also invest in the project of mitigation, getting off of fossil fuels by, uh, you know, building out clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. When uh, Superstorm Irene flooded Vermont, there was a really interesting combination of local volunteer action coalescing around town government, connecting with the state government and with the federal government to bring in aid to help rebuild the infrastructure. 
the United States, we have more than enough money. The private sector is sitting on more uninvested cash than at any time since the Federal Reserve kept these records starting in 1956. It's over $2 trillion. This is money firms are waiting to invest, not to give to their stockholders, but like looking for the next big thing. We have all the technology, right? We've got uh, wind and solar power. We have an electrical grid. We have electric vehicles. Not only these things have to be invented, they have to be brought to scale. And the government has uh, enormous amounts of money, as I said, the, the, the role of the big green buy, government purchasing. And we also have the laws in that the, the, the Clean Air Act of 1970 was modified by a lawsuit that in 2007 the Supreme Court said that the EPA must regulate greenhouse gas emissions. That's important because it means we don't actually have to pass new legislation through this rather extremely right-wing Congress that we have. What we need to do is be pressuring the government to follow the law and start imposing fines under the Clean Air Act on fossil fuel emitters. And if fines were imposed on fossil fuel emitters, it would mean that the cost of fossil fuel energy would go up and relative to the, to the cost of renewable energy, those would go down and that would, in that alone, would f start forcing investment into building out a clean tech sector and you'd start having economies of scale in, um, in all manner of technology from you know, vehicle production to building retrofitting and it would really help drive the transition.